Welcome to West Virginia Beer Roads, a podcast all about beer from a West Virginia perspective. I'm Aaron McCoy here with my podcast partner, Charles Bakwe. Today we're meeting with two of my favorite folks from over in the eastern panhandle of West Virginia, and that would be Denise and Carl Wagenbrenner, who are the proprietors of Berkeley Springs Brewing Company. So Aaron, have you ever been to the town of Bath, which I believe is the official name for Berkeley Springs? Unfortunately, I have not been to the town of Bath. Hopefully I'll get there soon. Well, I hope so too. But let me just bring in our guests right now. Denise and Carl, welcome to West Virginia Beer Roads. Thank you for having us. Thanks. Well, for our listeners to hear and anyone watching that has not had the opportunity to visit the Berkeley Springs Brewing Pub. Can you give me your elevator speech on what people will find when they do come visit your old pub? Prominently, you're coming out into the woods. So that's the first thing you notice. You're driving out of the town, coming out into a wooded area, and and we're nestled back in the trees in a a beautiful setting. And our little brew pub is, is very cozy, comfortable, um, it's a place where people can sit and hang out and make friends. And it's, it's very, um, it's very quaint. Um, and then the offering, of course, is 20 taps of our own craft beer, as well as our house-made kombucha and uh, root beer. Um, some nice food. We do a lot of freshly smoked meats, fresh sides. We do a lot of beer-infused foods. Um, and we try to keep the um, the food menu rotating almost as as much as the beer menu rotates. Um, and it's just it's just a comfortable setting. We have outside seating, so it's it's very much out in the woods. Yeah, I understand the two of you are true partners in this business. So tell me, how do you decide how you're going to split up responsibilities? Mm, that's pretty that's pretty easy as far as brewery. <laughs> yeah. Um, most of the pub management and kitchen management. Um, some things we cross over, um, but that's, that's kind of the main thing is we just try to section it off. Um, and then there's a lot of things that we, that we decide on jointly. Basically, I'm the brewer, I'm the maintenance guy. Um, I uh, try to coincide or coordinate with all of our uh, uh, employees so that we can get uh, beers canned in a timely manner and, and um, work with her basically to uh, figure out our brewing schedule, what we need to do when, which um, we're, we're coming around a little bit more and more every day. Um, we are um, currently working together to try to just get through these next couple of months and uh, working with distributors so that we can come out uh, in the springtime um, pretty much with our feet on the ground running. You've been in the brewery business, technically, I mean, the, the commercial brewery business, what, since, was it 2015 or when did you get your license? I mean, yeah. 2015 is when we got our license. Yeah. And before that, you guys operated a homebrew and winemaking supplies shop. I would just wonder if you could take me back and kind of tell me how you decided to go from that to become a cur- commercial brewery. Well, that's a long ways back, but you know, that's when I first met you, Charles. Yeah, um, I remember. You, showed, you mm-hmm. showed up there at the brew, at the, uh, the, the um, homebrew shop uh, when we were probably about a year, maybe a year and a half into it. Um, you know, we started that basically as um, just a means to get me out of the house and give me um, something else to do. I was in transition in careers and, and uh, couldn't do my previous job anymore. So worst part about it was um, we uh, really got into the game uh, with a, a lot of dreams, a lot of passion, and really not knowing what we were getting ourselves into at the moment. But it worked out pretty well. I think we started uh, we started our brewery in uh, 2015, right at the end of the last real um, uh, recession. Yeah, and 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 I'm curious too uh, for our listeners to hear why you thought Berkeley Springs was a good location. Uh, the location, not so much. 
It was the, the curve. water. Yeah, that that location there where you where you and I first met wasn't the greatest place right. to start. Yeah, I don't mean that location. I just meant why you decided to start a brewery in Berkeley Springs proper. You know, yeah. Truthfully, the town water is excellent for brewing beer. Um, it was also it's also been a very um, uh, a big tourist hub for the area. It draws people from the four state region and beyond. And it, it was really a no brainer for us. It's close proximity to where we live. So we didn't have to drive an hour to get to where we needed to be. Um, but then, you know, ultimately it was really the, the best plan of action when it came to brewing beer. Water here is excellent. It really is. Well, that's interesting. Yeah, that, that makes a big difference. And so often, I mean, historically, why a brewery was successful in a region or why they grew up because they had great water. True. So when you True. first you opened your you know, brewery, like you said, you were sort of on the near down or near downtown or on the edge of town there and uh, you decided that location wasn't best for you guys. And as Denise was saying earlier, you kind of moved out to the woods. Uh, Tell me why you decided to make that move and what that's meant for you. Well, we we grew our business to the point where we couldn't make it grow anymore in our last location. So we had to shut that down. We were losing our lease anyway, so we made the decision to shut that down and look for a new place to go. And we settled on Cool Font, um, again, simply because of the water to start with. And the building that we fell into here was really excellent for what we needed. Had the power, had water, had floor drains in the floor. This used to be a um, laundry facility for Cool Font Resort. So it had all of the things that we needed to get started. And it kept very our low. downtime very low. It, yeah. it only took me five months to get the brewery license back once we shut down our old place. You might tell your tell our listeners, uh, mention what Cool Font was or is. Um, so Cool Font Resort, was a huge hub for tourism for the Eastern Panhandle for 40, 45 years. Um, the previous owner passed away and the property went into re receivership and it was mothballed for 14 years. Uh, our landlord purchased the property at an auction and he'd been rebuilding it for about a year prior to us moving into this location. So it took them a little while to get the infrastructure back up, get the plumbing back up, start working with the electricity again, and get to a point where he, we would feel comfortable to even move in here. Um, it, um, it really worked out in the sense that it was it was it was it was all here. It was ready to go, and it was it was a shell of a building, and I just had to build it out. You know, so it, it worked out great. He was open to all of the expansion we wanted to do the add-ons, the, you know, everything that we were looking to do here, he was agreeable to. And the building had um, the units upstairs, which of course was a plus. Mm -hmm. Well, I, I guess the business must be really doing well because I see you purchased a new canning system. So talk about that and what it is gonna allow you to do that you couldn't do previously. Well, I don't know if that's a reflection of how well our business is doing um, because right. of course COVID, we took a major hit just like every small business and every uh, brewery did. Um, but it did give us um, the, it, it showed us just how important it was to be able to step up the canning game, uh, which we were mostly draft distribution. Um, and then of course there was the opportunity uh, through funds to be able to secure a loan for the canning line. So it, it's, it was, you know, it was a godsend really. And um, it's gonna increase our distribution tremendously. Oh, it's definitely gonna help us out. We, um, with, with previous funding, we'd gotten a cask MCS manual canning system. Uh, that pretty much takes about four and a half, almost five hours to do three barrels of beer in cans with two people working constantly. Uh, the new system actually with this next round of funding is going to help us to um, to do uh, approximately 30 cans a minute and um, hopefully get us over the hump to where we can can our beers when they're ready and not have to stage stage them or have to worry about having 28 barrels of beer ready and waiting for a mobile canning line to come in. 
So this new system we settled on, which is an American canning systems, uh, flex system, it does all the formats of cans. And um, now we've just got to find a labeler to make it all work. Well, and that, and that brings us, why he's talking about the size of cans is uh, like almost every brewery, we've expanded into seltzers. Um, and so a lot of those are done in the, the more slender cans, um, which is one thing we were keeping in mind with the new canning system, be able to do those those kind of cans. Yeah, it sounds like you're adding a lot of flexibility there. That's fantastic. Uh, but Carl, let's uh, go back and now move over to review your brewing philosophy. I mean, I know you began by making a, a, a line of core beers, uh, that were very drinkable, very traditional styles. I, I have one that I'm drinking now, this uh, Kakapen Kolsch. And, uh, and I think Aaron has one too, is your Stonewall IPA. Stonewall right. IPA, yes. So anyway, uh, what, what were you, the, your philosophy? I mean, you know, how, did, how did you decide to, what you were gonna start with like that and what you made as your core line? Well, the core line seems to be changing just a little bit. We are trying to stick with uh, five beers that we keep on tap at all times. Uh, Cacape and Kolsch being one of them, Warm Springs Pale Ale being another one. Um, Sto Brown. Berkeley Brown and our Stonewall IPA. Stonewall IPA is, is beginning to take a backseat to a couple of other ones that we're bringing out. Uh, one thing that I found out with Stonewall um, is late editions of lemon peel later on down the line don't necessarily uh, ha have uh, shelf staying power. So uh, we figured that out a little too late to the game, but I'm changing things up a little bit. We're bringing out our um, Lover's Leap IPA, which is gonna take the place of Stonewall, <clears throat> excuse me, as far as um, uh, dra uh, distribution wise in cans. Now, draft-wise, we'll probably still bring out Stonewall for uh, for for distribution as well, but um, probably not going to go into cans for the near future. They have to be kept cold. That beer has to be kept cold, um, just like a lot of New England IPAs do. I think initially, the core, we tried to make sure we came out with a few styles that had broad appeal to many different people and to make those as... Uh, like you said, drinkable and appealing because we didn't want to just come out and be like, oh, this is what we do. And this is all we do. All we do is sours or all we do is, you know, IPAs. So we really believe in the philosophy of trying to have um, a selection of, of beers that appeal to a mass, a mass amount of people. Um, and that's why it was, you know, the Kolsch, the Amber, the Brown, a pale ale. We tried to hit one five of the basic styles and come up with a good one for each of those before we moved on to lots of different ones. Yeah, and I think that's what you find in a lot of breweries. I mean, you start somewhere where you just start and then you test the market and you then you learn and you find things and you make adjustments. And I, I'm hearing you're making those adjustments in your line and that's good to hear. Uh, and what would be, just before we leave the core line, what are the better sellers for you guys in the core? Kolsch by far. Kolsch by far always has been our best. Berkeley Brown. Um, Berkeley Brown runs up a close second. Warm mm -hmm. Springs Pale Ale, probably third. Um, the IPAs, was Stonewall was, I mean, at times Stonewall would move so fast I couldn't keep up with it. Um, and... Uh, you know, the, um, apple yeah, the apple butter ale, we do that uh, once a year um, and we try to do enough of it to make it so that we can put it out in, uh, in distribution. Um, this past year, however, it, it, we had a late frost. We were not able to get the, the apples that we needed to at the time that we needed them. And, you know, of course we had to bring that beer out really late. Uh, but we still had it. We still brought it out and uh, people still loved it. And I'm still getting calls for it. So, you know, it's one of those great things. I love to have the beer really hit, hit the market and hit, hit strong and, and people left waiting and wanting more. So, Well, as far as I know, you're the only West Virginia brewer to make gluten-free tea beers. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the gluten-free tea beers. Yeah. Um, Tell me about how you how you did that. There, that's got to be a great story. 
Well, well can I sell it? Yeah, go ahead, babe. Okay, so the, the tea concept was a spinoff from the kombucha. So I had been developing many different kombucha recipes and we were talking, we, we had customers who would come in and not only ask for gluten-free uh, drink options, but they were asking for gluten-free food. And so we, we started talking about it and thinking, you know, how can we offer something? And, um, you know, you know, let's do something different. So we don't believe in using a lot of artificial flavors at all. So, you know, I just kind of, we, we just talked about it. And I said, well, what if we used some of the teas that I like and we use that for the flavor. And he said, yeah, we could do that. So we took, one of my staples was the mandarin orange rooibos and he developed a recipe using white sorghum. And then- That was I, our first one. Yeah, and then I really like uh, green tea. So I had been doing some green tea kombucha and he took that and it came out as a sour. And that um, one's not gluten-free by the way. That's not gluten-free. And then of course the other ones were just using like blackberry tea an Earl Grey tea, and the Earl Grey tea was probably the the most fun uh, as an experiment because we had no idea how that was going to turn out. Because when you drink hot Earl Grey tea, the flavor that comes through in the in the seltzer with the tea beer is way different. But it was so refreshing and like lemon lime, but very uh, very refreshing. And so the test batch of that, we were so nervous. And then the test batch, we tried it and we're like, that is so good. And the blackberry is the same way. I mean, blackberry is just a staple berry of this area. So we had to do a blackberry. Mm -hmm. um, and they were just, we experimented with them and they took off and we just, we, we were said, okay, so here we go. And then um, late last year, we experimented and we did a peach. Yeah. So basically it's the not necessarily a tea, I found a, it's called a tisane, but it's a dried fruit blend. So kind of the same concept, we're not, we're using the dried fruit to extract the flavor rather than tea, um, but it came out really, really, really nice. So it's okay. kind of a mixture of not using fresh fruit, but not using artificial flavors either. I was just gonna say, it's definitely an unusual product for a beer brewery or brewery, excuse me. I'm curious to see what's the public reaction been for you all. Well, the product itself oh, has been has been very well received. The problem we had initially with um, distribution was because we called them tea beers. Is so tea drinkers got it, but if they weren't necessarily beer drinkers, they would shy away. If they were craft beer drinkers. They didn't want anything to do with it because they didn't consider it real beer. So we're kind of in a bit of a transition right now where we're rewording the labels for those cans. In-house, no problem. We can sell it all day long. They'll grab the cans. They don't care what's on the label. But to put it out in distribution, the marketing side of it was tough. So we're basically turning a lot of those from being tea beer to what we're calling our seltzers with tea make okay. tea so you're transitioning the name are you, but yes. you're still going to continue right. to so we've lumped them all into one right. into one classification as far as the tea beers go okay but uh we are trying to differentiate now so we've got a couple of them that are going to stay tea beers like the sorghum the um green the tea. the green tea that's that's um made with malt um and then the others are going to be labeled and, and marketed as seltzers. Yeah. Okay. Well, Charles and I um, have a uh, blackberry tea <laughs> beer here. I'm glad uh, you do. We, we, we would like to crack open and, and taste and would love for you to describe it as we, as, as you <laughs> perceive that the customer should expect it to taste as, as we're tasting it. And then in addition, if you could just talk about, I know you've already kind of mentioned a little bit um, but if you could talk about some of your more popular tea beers or the ones that you're transitioning to your seltzer line, that would be great if you haven't already touched base about it. Sure. Well, you're uh, opening and pouring the Blackberry. That was um, one that came about with a, a, mod a, a minuscule amount of uh, experimentation. Basically, we just 
had to have a fermentation or, or a fermentable and we added tea to it. And the fermentable was simple, very simple. So as anybody knows seltzers, it's just sugar. That's all it is. It's corn but, sugar. But the flavor that's coming through, mm -hmm. the blackberry flavor, I think it's um, it's very thirst quenching, mm -hmm. which you don't often, I don't get when I drink seltzers. Because to me, seltzers have a lot of artificial flavors. They taste fake. And they taste, yeah, they taste fake, but they don't necessarily quench your thirst. Now, maybe that's intentional because you just keep drinking more. But <laughs> with the tea, with the tea beers, you drink that and you actually feel satisfied. Your thirst is quenched, but then, you know, you have a great flavor and you have a, a modest amount of alcohol. It's yeah, so, very aromatic. There, you you definitely get a lot yeah. of blackberry out of that. Yeah, yeah, Denise, I'm I'm curious on on the ingredients when it's got. I mean, it has blackberry and blackberry tea, but mm -hmm. I mean, does it when it says tea? Does that mean it also has the tea leaf tea and not just a, an herb of a blackberry something? I mean, correct. Explain it's that. Actually one. A, it's actually a blackberry flavored black tea that he steeps and is part of the recipe. That's a very interesting flavor. I, I you know, I can get some of that fruitiness of the blackberry and then also, you know, get some of the tannins and things from the tea as mm -hmm. well. Yeah, it's- Like uh, you're drinking tea, yeah. Mm -hmm. But I, I can also see how you, when you previously described, you know, kind of combining the lines, I mean, that makes sense. I get how it can be perceived as sort of a seltzer, you know, based on the different consumer, you know, and who's drinking it. I mean, it. I can see that very, very mm -hmm. easily. Yeah, but it was difficult at first when we started getting them into distribution. Like I said, you know, the um, when they were putting them in with the craft beer, craft beer drinkers would shy away from them a lot because, oh, it's not, that's not beer. That's not really beer. And then the <laughs> seltzer drinkers were not looking in the beer section for them. Right, and for label approval for those, we had to actually have them tested as seltzers. Yes. Right. They actually right. fall under the, yeah, the FDA. Yeah, because of the ingredients, the mm -hmm. fermentables. Yeah. And I think, you know, putting a seltzer label on them will probably only help the sales because, you know, the, the market for seltzers is very hot right now and mm -hmm. it's not sure going to cool down anytime soon. Right. But you'll notice with, like, especially that blackberry, there's, there's a little more body to it. Right, it's there you is. actually take you actually feel like you're drinking something with substance rather than just some flavored sparkling water. Right, more than more so than just like a fizzy drink. There is definitely yeah. some yeah. substance there. Yeah. Yep. All right, you know, um, from watching your social media and from hearing you guys even talk earlier in this program, uh, you put a lot of emphasis on your food, and I I, I think that's wonderful, and I want you to. Talk us through your your primary food menu, your some of your hot items, your your the things that are popular at the brew pub. Our brisket. Sure. Our brisket. <laughs> His brisket. In many, many places around our area, like in Maryland and, and Virginia, you're not allowed to have food per se. You can have a food truck, but you're not supposed to have food in your brew pub. Um, we always had the philosophy when we first started this that food goes with beer and vice versa so we got out of here we tried to figure out a way to stand out amongst all the other food venues in town and nobody was doing barbecue at the, at the time of uh, of any note so one thing i just love alongside with brewing beer is smoking meats i really enjoy just basically boring myself to death for 10 to 12 hours and sitting out there <laughs> manning a stick stick smoker so that's pretty much what i do don't let him fool you he listens to podcasts and thinks up <laughs> recipes and you know we developed our own dry rub you mm -hmm. know to make it very unique yep. um you know pork turkey um salmon ribs those are the main things we do on the smoker and then of course just doing some sides and and appetizers but Anything we can put beer in, we do. Yep. So we're making our own barbecue sauces. We yeah. make our own rubs. Our beer cheese. I mean, we make our own anything beer cheese. at all that if, if if it calls for a liquid, we figure out what beer we can put in it. Yep. <laughs> yep. 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 
Hit on a couple of uh, other items on your food menu beyond the barbecue that are popular with your customers. Well, right. definitely our, our brownie, we make a beer infused brownie. So it's just your basic brownie, but we put normally the Berkeley Brown beer in it if we have it available. Super if not, or, or a stout. <laughs> or stout. <laughs> in, the, in the brownies. Um, yeah. And then, of course, our beer cheese. Usually, we like to put the the Kolsch. That's our our staple one for the beer cheese. Yeah. Um, we'll make uh, beer cheesecakes. Um, that that's probably the most popular items in addition to the meats. So, do you have any special food and beer events that you hope to do at the brew pub? Uh, maybe this summer when we can yes. get some people in there. <laughs> so, sure. some of our traditional ones that got you know, put on the wayside for 2020. Um, we're going to be doing a Memorial Day weekend. Um, we want to do a, a low country boil for that weekend. Um, and then Father's Day, which I think is in or around West Virginia Day, we do the West Virginia hot dog. Um, and then, um, let's see, September, I guess Labor Day, we're going to do another seafood event. But we were just talking about doing a monthly smoker event. So we mm -hmm. want to do like like once a month, you know, maybe we'll do like whole chickens on the smoker or something different that we don't normally do uh, and offer that. And then um, in November, we do our annual um, beer and bacon fest for Veterans Day. So we'll be excited to actually be able to do that again for real. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, it's. It really just depends on um, what the cooks and Denise come up with during the course of the week as to what I'm going to be cooking, yeah. <laughs> really. So um, it, I, they, they get a little wild sometimes, and I've, I've got to make room in between the brisket <laughs> and the pulled pork in the smoker yeah. for their ideas. So yeah. like we do a, um, a Texas Twinkie mm -hmm. that is Twinkie. insane. Yeah. Uh, basically, it's a jalapeno cut in half stuffed with... Um, uh, cream cheese and, and brisket pieces and wrapped with bacon and then you put a little bit of a nice sweet glaze on it it's it's sickly insane I love it mm -hmm. but you know um, smoke baked beans smoke mac and cheese yeah, yeah. Um, you know if I'll roll a fatty where it'll be three different ground meats and then a lattice of bacon wrapped over that and smoked and then we'll we'll put a glaze on that and you know, it really just depends on what the, the ladies have in store. I mean, I, I'm, I'm whatever, you know, I'll cook whatever they ask me to cook. Oh boy, oh, you guys are making stuff. me hungry. <laughs> <laughs> right? That all sounds absolutely delicious. Mm -hmm. um, I, I, though, I've also seen that you guys have developed an Airbnb operation at the oh, brewery. Right. Mm -hmm. And that's definitely something that most breweries don't have. So let's talk about that. Wonderful thing. The, we've got five apartments above uh, our brewery and three of those apartments were turning into a bed and breakfast or bed, uh, and, bed brew. and brew package. Uh, we've got one done right now. We just finished the second one. We're going to start listing it and the third one's coming up behind it. Um, hopefully we'll have them all done for springtime. But um, that was part of the plan when we first moved out here was to create something else, a little more of a draw for, for ourselves as well as for Cool Font. Um, they have uh, a large amount of lodging across the road. So we're just trying to accent and, and ride right along with that. Have you, so the one that you have finished, have you had any tenants yet or is it newly? Oh tenants? gosh, yes. Yeah. Oh, okay. Well, tell me, yeah. tell me where <laughs> those people are coming from. Where are your guests? Most, wow. Yeah, mostly DC, Baltimore, Annapolis. Yeah. We've had uh, guests from New York. Wow. Um, yeah, I, would, I guess we've, we've got long distance couples. Uh, guy lives in Pittsburgh, a girlfriend lives in Virginia, and they meet here. Mm -hmm. You mm -hmm. know, they went to college together and they've got jobs separately and found they show up here. And I, we get a lot of that, even mm -hmm. with our customers. You know, we, we become the, the meeting place for a lot of families when they're traveling through the area or they're just stopping in to have a meal and, and, grab a growler and move on you know yeah that's my favorite thing to have like multi-generations come in mm -hmm. where we've got you know you got the grandchildren and the children and the grandparents 
I love to see that. It, it, it's just, it's, it's amazing to have them all come in and sit down and they all find something to drink and eat, you know, yeah. and that's why we were, we wanted to make sure we, we kept our, our, our drink offerings and our food offerings universal like that so that anybody coming in, it, it, you know, whether they come in and say, well, I don't really like beer, we're going to turn them onto the tea beers. Yeah. or kombucha or root beer whatever yeah we make our own house made root beer for the kids um kombucha as well for the kids it's um for our granddaughter it's her pink soda mm -hmm. you can so. have as much <laughs> as she wants you yeah. know and we, we we found that that families really enjoy that because some people you know they're not always into beer we've got uh, one guy who comes in strictly for our beer and he tried to bring his daughters in and they wouldn't come oh wow. like beer so well, that makes started. it like a destination type then for you all, which is great for your business and for the community. Sure. It's been excellent for that. And, you know, that that's that same guy. He started bringing his daughters in after we started making kombucha. Oh, my goodness. There's something new that they can drink. They, they really enjoy the gluten-free options now. So to be able to do that and offer such a variety has, has been really good. To, to, to draw people in and then keep them, keep them coming back for more. You know, we've got 20 different taps and I'm constantly brewing something different, new and exciting for me anyway. I just hope it's exciting for others when they come in. But, um, you know, who knows? We're, um, hopefully we're going to be here for a long time doing this very thing, you know? Well, Carl, with your, uh, your new canning line and get coming online shortly, uh, you've, Got to have a lot of confidence in the distribution market there. I'm sure you're looking at more distribution. So tell me a little about your view and what your thoughts are on the West Virginia beer market in general. How do you see it? Is it, is it doing well? There's a lot of room for improvement. It is doing better than expected considering COVID. Um, for cans. For cans. Um, draft, of course, draft just died off immediately. Um, we had three large orders pending um, and then COVID hit and those three large orders dropped down to a half of an order <laughs> from one distributor. The other two, they dropped their order altogether. Um, I'm sure you're, I'm sure he's familiar with yeah. the, the new bill, right? The, the bill that's just been introduced, what is it? 229, 299. Anyway, there's a lot of, a uh, lot of good points in there mm -hmm. where they're, they're starting to see the, um, you know, the importance of the breweries and wineries and distilleries as far as tourism, mm -hmm. but the direct ship, that yeah. would be a huge market uh, to be able to ship beer. We, we get requests all the time and we, um, we're like, we're sorry, we can't ship it to you. It's West Virginia won't let us, you know, um, there's, there is, there is a lot of room for growth, but we're seeing, uh, we're seeing more and more, um, restaurants are starting to op open up more to the idea of either draft or cans of craft beer as a way to stay connected to the local breweries um, and to be able to offer something different. So I'm seeing that a little bit more, not just package stores, but restaurants that are starting to consider if they don't want to put a draft system in, they'll, they'll at least consider bringing in cans or bottles of local beer. So yeah, I mean, I, I think we're going to see we're going to see more growth, especially because of the tourism. One good thing you're seeing is that we didn't see a whole lot of breweries go belly up in West Virginia. That was really good. That was I was really happy to see that. I I really thought there'd be a lot more, um, but then here on the backside of COVID, we're starting to see a lot more breweries in planning in the four state region. So in, in our area, you know, we're not in the meat and potatoes of West Virginia. We're in the Eastern Panhandle, spitting distance with four states. And we're starting to see a lot more tourism just for beer in the four state region. And there's three breweries and planning in the area, plus one just, uh, just opened up here in town. Right. So yeah, it's, it's, it's looking good in that sense. Um, now everybody's waiting for COVID to lift and, and have uh, restrictions lifted again so that we can get back to, to draft sales. Um, but uh, I think we're, we're still a good six to eight months away from all of that happening, I believe. But, um, you know, it just as a state of West Virginia,
beer industry goes, tourism is going to be where it's at. Uh, directed consumer shipping is going to be where it's at. Um, loosening up some of the restrictions on um, beer collaborations between breweries within in-state. Um, contract brewing uh, out of state. Actually, in our in our circumstance, we don't have any large breweries in the area that we can contract with, so we have to go out of state. That presents other problems with West Virginia ABCA. So we want to uh, we want to see a lot of that open up, make it more conducive for business. Um, basically, you know, you, you think about what's happening in Maryland. They are the past three years or so. They really opened up um, the uh, the code for breweries to be able to get set up to do collaboration to actually brew as a, a alternating proprietorship without having their own brick and mortar place um, that helps a brewery try to get established and then get their place opened up also helps other breweries to get established in the sense where well, we've got distributors that really want our beer but we can't make x amount of beer we have to go somewhere else and have them make that beer for us and it's, it's got to be a seamless and easy transition, and it's not right now. It's pretty tough for breweries to be able to collaborate and work together um, in the sense that, um, you know, West Virginia really shouldn't care where the brews, beer's being brewed as long as they get their taxes, as long as it's being sold within the state of West Virginia, and they're getting paid for it. Yeah. We really hope to see some of that change. Um, we, there's been a lot of uh, changes over the past five years. Well, yeah, 10 since years since we got our license, but 10 years or so, um, there's a lot of big changes have happened since long, since before we got our license. Um, and it's been slowly, it's been piecemeal. It's been slowly trickling in. Um, and you know, there's, there's a lot of reasons for that, but, um, I think we're on the right direction. We're in the right direction. Um, and hopefully we'll be able to, um, uh, get on a more even playing field not only with other states, our surrounding states, but also within the state as far as wineries, breweries, distilleries, and, and uh, cider makers, all of us being able to play evenly. It's not the way it is right here in West Virginia. Right. Well, as you mentioned just previously, you know, now there is a second brewery in your area in Berkeley Springs. And, you know, of course, people would say that having two breweries is definitely better than one because your town's going to start getting more of a reputation for local beer. And then more people, of course, hopefully would want to visit. Do you see this happening in your area? Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we're happy that uh, they opened up. It took them a very long time to get open. Um, but, um, you know, that. I walked that building. I know what kind of money that they had to put into that building. We turned that building down twice. It was a big project. I, my pockets were not deep enough. But um, it's a different feeling too. Some, a whole different atmosphere. Totally, totally to, different to atmosphere. To being in town and, and the way they're set up. And then of course, you know, us mm -hmm. being out here in a wooded, more resort area. So it's yep. two very distinct styles. And even we'll have people come and they'll compare our colches. They'll compare... Oh, well, they have this IPA and yours is this and that. So it's mm -hmm. kind of fun in, in that aspect that when we were the only one, um, those, those people who didn't have anything to compare us to, they could come in and be super critical. And now like, oh, there's another brewery. Oh, oh, it's the same way there. So, you know, it, it's kind of, kind of helps us not, <laughs> you know, it's like, see, <laughs> it's not just us, you know, so, yeah. um, you know, it, it was, it, it's really hard because when we first opened, as far as locals, um, the locals did not know what to make of us. They had no idea what we were doing, why we were trying to do it. Like, why do you got to make beer? There's Budweiser. Like, they just <laughs> didn't get it, right? So right. our customer base was really the, the, the tourists and the weekenders mm -hmm. who, who found us and they were like, hallelujah, <laughs> yeah. you're doing this in this little town, you know? And then, um, so a lot of those locals have now come around that we either have come in and checked us out, tried some of our beer and either come in to eat and everything. But um, yeah, having, having something to compare yeah. has been wonderful. <laughs> you know, since we've been here, um, there's a distillery that's opening up in town. There's a winery that's opened up about a half a mile away from us. Um, 
the uh, the new brewery Cape and Mound, they've opened up, and it's become more of a tourist destination for that reason. Uh, it's it's really like um, it's really opened our eyes to what the town actually goes through to bring tourism here. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, we were outsiders looking in. We really didn't have a clue. And now we, we have a, a much better understanding as to what it takes to bring those tourism dollars here. And, uh, you know, to be honest, if they're going to come see us, they're going to come see them and vice versa. And we well, see and, that all across the board. And on that note, um, you know, with everything as far as tourism coming to the area, how do you think that impacts your future plans to grow your own personal business in conjunction with that as a whole for the community? I think it's going to be excellent. Yeah, it draws more, more people, draws more money to the area, draws more attention to us and to our area. Um, we, the, had, um, we had more real estate sold here right. during COVID than ever. Yeah. The real estate market here exploded because of people who on the news, they saw we were the only state that wasn't in the red. <laughs> so guess what? They all came here right. <laughs> um, and they found places to stay. They found houses to buy. Well, you know, our goal has always been to grow and become a four state regional player. Um, we are, we've still got our sights on that. This year, of course, put us back, but um, we're, we're, we're still plugging along, trying to go after that, you know. Um, I'm not 30 years old anymore, and <laughs> this, is, this is it for me. This is, this is my end game. We've, um, we've put all of our eggs into this basket and then some, and we are hopefully going to turn this into something that's going to outlast both of us. Uh, the labor pool around here is pretty shallow. So it's really tough to find good people. It's tough to find uh, people to help you get to the next, get over that hump so that you can move on to the next thing. You know, um, when you're stuck brewing the beer and cooking the food and working every weekend and every holiday, you burn out. Um, I started this game thinking, hey, I'm going to be able to do this, this, and this, and this, and then she's going to do this and this and this and this. And then come to find out all those hats get to be, get to be very heavy. So it's, it's tough to wear all those hats at the same time. Well, but um, as far as growth goes, you know, we're still pushing along. We've got some great people we found along the way, and that's still going to keep going. We're still going to find good people. We're still going to be pushing into uh, distribution channels in Maryland, West Virginia, Virginia, and Pennsylvania. And um, we are still going to grow as long as we're able to um, uh, continue this slow progressive trajectory of growth that we've been on um i think we're going to be all right i think we're going to be fine plus you know all the other things that are happening around us only help us you know uh, tourism uh cape and mountain um or great cape and state park uh cool font resort all of that just adds to the people coming to the area more people are here more people want to buy our beer Another thing that I focus on when I go out into, because I've kind of become our, our salesperson, or pretty much like I'm like the link between our distributors and us. Um, I've been focusing a lot on um, cross promotion. So okay. going out to local businesses or businesses where our distributors go to and figuring out how we can cross promote, you know, you carry our brand, how can I promote you? We'll send people to you, that kind of thing. So that that's huge. And it was something I think that had kind of got away from a lot of businesses prior to COVID. Um, COVID hit and all of a sudden it, it, you know, it was very important to uh, support local and to um, support each other, you know, and, and that's what we'll continue to do. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, you know, do you talked a little bit about that? I know we mentioned your canning line. I specifically want to ask just about West Virginia. I think Charles is going to touch on maybe, maybe some other regions in a minute, but how are you going to handle getting more distribution across West Virginia itself? We already have statewide distribution with um, our two main distributors of West Virginia, uh, North Central and Joe's Globe. And, um, it's been a little slow, 
you know, all the distributors, they focus now on their, their, their core brands. They're the ones that actually keep them in business, the big boys. And uh, a lot of us have actually fallen by the wayside. We gave up a lot of our um, self-distribution rights, except for in our local area, just simply because it's just too much, too much to handle, you know? Um, so we, the problem was when we had, before COVID, we had statewide distribution. We, you know, we've, we've had it for a couple of years now, but we we're pushing out a lot more beer a lot faster. There was a lot of draft. There's a lot of draft going out the door. Now it's all cans and shelf, shelf space is, is a premium. Cooler um, space, cooler is, space is next to non-existent. Yeah. You know, you, you got to be a, a, a local brewery with impeccable um, New England IPAs that only have a shelf space of 30 days to be in a cooler. You know, and um, that's been the toughest thing for us being that we're so far away from everyone else. You know, so to be, to be able to offer <clears throat> uh, what the distributors could sell in the quantity they needed it in a timely manner was difficult at our current size and with our limited canning abilities. So yeah, working with a mobile canner had its problems. Yeah. So our focus now is we've already started reaching out to the distributors to let them know, OK, we're going to have a new canning line. Um, and this is the three beers that we're focusing on. Go out and sell these now. So it's a lot of pre-order, pre-sell um, to kind of get ahead of it and, and get us back rolling again. Like you said, uh, you're in the looking at the four-state market that you're in. That's certainly, you know, you not only get walk-in customers at the pub from there, but that's, I imagine you're still looking at this distribution in that four state region. I know a couple of years back, Maryland, you all were hot for Maryland. That's all, you know, stuff from Baltimore and other places where you were, you know, doing things. I mean, how's that going for you in the other states uh, in the market? Uh, we only have uh, out of state distribution in Maryland currently. Um, we're not big enough for what for Virginia to really take notice of us yet. We'll be there. Uh, Pennsylvania, it's, it's, it's such a regional thing with Pennsylvania. It's really tough to get into that market as well. You've got to be a little bigger than what we are, but we're, we're going to get there. Um, but we do have two uh, distributors in Maryland that handle Western Maryland and uh, down to Frederick, Maryland. So from Frederick West, we've, we've got distribution. And are you happy um, with what you're seeing, uh, the response in Maryland? For the most part, yeah. For the most part, we are. But again, you know, the, the distributors are are catering to their 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 big sponsors. You know, um, it's Plus, really uh, you, like you mentioned. There's a lot of new breweries popping up in Western Maryland now. I've noticed. You know, it used to be just like Antietam was the only one, and now there's right. like five or six over there. Right, right, yep. right. Yep, and you know, some of those they they have distribution aspirations, but. Some of them don't. They just want to do it in-house, and that's all they want to do. Um, you know, and for us, we're just trying to find a place to fit in. You know, those those guys, we, we've talked to almost all of them. There's a couple of them we haven't been able to reach out to recently. but um, So we had a group of Shriners come in over the weekend and started talking to us about doing brewery tours. So that's kind of the aspect with the tourism. So they're putting together a bus, and they're going to sell tickets, and they're going to start – in Williamsport and hit and come up to our place and go up to Cumberland and hit those. So they're going to do, you know, bust brewery tours. Yeah. Um, so that's great to see. There's finally enough of us close enough together that they can make a day out of it. So it's good to see that there's enough of us around to really draw enough attention that, hey, we're, we're finally on the beer tour. Mm -hmm. So yeah, I, I, I find it interesting that West Virginia brewers have focused on Western Maryland. And I guess it was because in the last you know 20 years, there hasn't been a lot of brewing taking place in Western Maryland. But you've got Mountain State from, you know, Tucker County there in Day, uh, not uh, Thomas. You've got uh, Screech Owl uh, now distributing in Maryland. You've got uh, Short Story now with a pub like Mountain State has a pub there in Deep Creek Lake. You know, it's mm -hmm. interesting how we're taking, you know, West Virginia breweries and now, of course, like you guys too, and I'm not sure if there's others. Well, yeah, it's certainly Greenbrier Valley distributes in Maryland. I don't know how strongly are in Western Maryland. 
But it's like, yeah, all these West Virginia breweries are moving into Western Maryland. Do you know why? Do you know why? Well, you one of the reasons me. is initially, and we did this initially, Maryland actually allowed a licensed out-of-state brewery to apply for a permit to self-distribute in Maryland. And that permit only cost $50 and we could self-distribute in Maryland. Of course, it made sense for us, look how close we are. Right. So a lot of the small breweries could self-distribute themselves right into Maryland. They made it so easy. We did that for what, a year and a half, almost two years. And then we said, okay, this is a little bit more than we want to, to do. And we then we signed on distributors and gave them those accounts that we had established. So it's a great way to get your foot in the door in that state. Um, and it requires a lot of work initially on people from the brewery. We found that out in that you can't just sign a distributor and think that they are gonna go out and be able to sell your product like you can. Right. So what I've been doing is getting back into going out with the distributors, going out and visiting accounts because we know the product. Our distributors will sell whatever they can sell, but they don't know our products as well. So it does take effort on the part of the brewery to go out and, and help those distributors um, establish the accounts, make the sales, and then they're happy to store it in their warehouse and deliver it for you. Like Charles mentioned, there's there's two other breweries in the um, uh, Ski Wisp and uh, Deep Creek Lake area. And the main reason why they're there is Ski Wisp and Deep Creek Lake. Mm -hmm. There is a huge tourism area right there. And I mean, it's there's a lot of people that come out there that drink beer. Mm -hmm. it, it makes perfect sense. Uh, short story did a it was a perfect move for them um, and then of course you know um, Mountain State those guys were they've been there for probably a decade and a half now maybe more when you asked about why did we come out to cool font well the owner who bought cool font he wanted us out here we became an attraction of the resort so we're a draw for the resort. The resort is a draw for us. Yeah. It all sounds like a good fit. And um, Carl and Denise, before we wrap this interview up, talking about beer and distribution and what's available out there, what are some upcoming beers that you are going to release that we can have people, our listeners, <laughs> look out for? What can you you say, hey, this is what's up and coming from Berkeley Springs? Uh, start with let's go with the one we work we've been working on uh, quite a lot recently. Uh, Ebitz Trail. Ebitz uh, Mountain Wit. I'm sorry, Ebitz Mountain Wit. Ebitz Trail. It's named after Ebitz Trail. Um, when you go to uh, Rocky Gap State Park and you look at the Great Big Casino, right behind the casino is Ebitz Mountain, and there's a trail that goes to the top of that mountain. It's a really nice wit. Uh, we believe it's going to. Um, it's, it's going to go along right next to the, the, the blue moon drafts and all of that. And uh, it's going to be a competing, uh, uh, a little bit of a competing factor for the taste buds. You know, it'll give you something else to try out there. Um, we like to try to do beers for our, our regional area, uh, as well as try to reflect some of the crazy things that's going on in the world right now. So the next one is Pivot Pale Ale. Uh, every time you turn around, you turn the TV on, or you listen to anything on on uh, the internet, uh, any news source, it was always pivot. We got to do this. Pivot. We got to do that. Especially in the brewing industry, oh they use the word pivot like constantly. Everywhere. So, but he was working on a new IPA recipe. So I don't know what to call it. I said, I think we just need to call it pivot because that's all we've done in 2020 was pivot. Yep. And and how would this one taste? What were you looking for to get in the taste? Of a new IPA. Uh, Pivot, uh, Pivot is a pale ale. It's going to be along the lines of um, maybe like Halleck. Um, I'm looking for a real piney uh, note with um, a strong malty backbone, um, kind of like on the edge between pale ale and IPA, and um, try to appeal to more of the 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 bitter taste buds, you know, the, the West Coast style IPAs. Um, 
something that's going to be a lot more shelf stable as well. So uh, we're looking for something that we can put into cans and is, is going to be able to, to stay on the shelf for some, some time. And, and uh, you know, we're trying to turn a few other heads with our, um, our seltzers as well. So we've got a couple of other flavors we're trying to bring out with those as, as well as the, uh, the Earl Grey and the Blackberry. And he's working on um, a line of sours because oh, yeah. predominantly we, we haven't done much in the, in the line of sours. Um, so uh, we're working on maybe four or five different flavors that will yeah, be I, a, a line. I used to say if I chased every trend, I'd do nothing but chase my tail. And apparently that's what I have to do is chase all the trends anyway. So the, um, a lot of breweries are doing the fruited sours. And we're just jumping on the bandwagon and we're calling it the Snally Gaster series. Um, <laughs> the, yeah, the, the what now? Snally Gaster sour. Snally Gaster, okay. <laughs> You'll right. have to Google it and look at the picture of some of the drawings of Snally Gasters. Okay. So the Snally Gaster, it basically it's a silly name for a silly beer. It's a beer that really should not be, but it's an American thing. We bastardize everything we touch. So it turned into a really cool beer. And it's just something new that we're trying to bring out to go right along with that trend of the fruity sour. Yeah. Um, so the first one came out is uh, with, with raspberry puree. It's actually raspberries that we picked out of our backyard, but sitting in my freezer for about two years and I boiled it all down and added it to 11 gallons of beer. I sold out of it last weekend yeah. and I, I, I got people bugging me for more. Yeah. So we're going to be making a lot more of that as well as experimenting with different uh, purees and flavors as well to go with it. But the base beer is basically going to be the same. And we didn't touch on the alcoholic kombucha. So oh, we yeah. did our first batch We've been of, busy al this past year. of alcoholic kombucha last year. We turned the mandarin orange rubus kombucha into alcoholic kombucha. And that's been a big hit. Mm -hmm. So there'll be more of that to come. And um, I like experimenting with herbs and different teas. So there'll be some more tea beers for sure. Yeah, I took our um, Mountain Man Martson and uh, took 10 gallons off of a batch that we made and I threw a SCOBY in it. And it came out different. I wouldn't say it's amazing, it's not my cup of tea, but other people love it. You know, it's just my, my flavor profile is a little different, I suppose, but yeah. you know, it's just something different, something, something new and exciting. I wanted to throw, try and throw out there. Um, you know, we're doing uh, oh, our, all of our teas yeah. as well as starting to do some, some hop infused uh, tea beers as well. Mm. Um, so that's, that's a totally different thing. I'm still working on that. Uh, barrel aged beers. We're bringing out some barrel agers. We've had them in um, bourbon barrels over the past year and a half, almost two years for one of them. And uh, I'm starting to do some of those 22 ounce bombers only sold here in house. Um, and, you know, we're really it just it, it, the ideas change weekly. You know, um, she'll come up with something. I'll come up with something. The bartenders come up with something. The cooks come up with something. <laughs> hey, I want to cook this. Can you bring me a beer for this? Okay, I don't have anything on tap. Well, when can you get it done? Well, it sounds like you guys have some really great ideas. I know I look forward to it. I'm sure Charles and all of our listeners definitely do as well. So, Charles, back yeah, to Yeah, we're going to wrap this up now. These guys, uh, you know, Denise, Carl, you guys are amazing what you're doing, what you've built there, the new operation at Cool Font. Uh, how it's, you know, it's Airbnb, it's a wonderful barbecue restaurant, it's all these beers, it's kombucha, you know, it's seltzer, it's, uh, it's amazing what all you're building there, and I think you're going to be a, a mainstay of the local tourism industry for, for many years, so I want to thank you guys again for joining us today on uh, West Virginia Beer Roads. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you all. Good luck. Thanks, Aaron. This brings us to the close of another podcast. Remember, you can subscribe on Apple, Spotify, or your favorite podcast host. Thank you for listening to West Virginia Beer Roads. West Virginia Beer Roads is a production of BrilliantStream.com.